All right, y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much for breaking through the awkward wall with somebody and just being like, yo, what's up? Thanks, thanks for being here. Uh, if I didn't get a chance to say hi to you to yet, my name is Jimmy. I get the privilege of being the young adult pastor at Praise Church. And uh, man, this is incredible to see that, that on a Tuesday night, y'all could be anywhere. Like, wings are cheap at B-dubs right now, but you're still here at Praise, uh, Praise Church. I guess you're here. You're here at Praise Young Adults. This may not be our building, but this is our church. It's kind of what we've been saying. We may not have walls, but we have a city. And uh, if you choose to let God use you, he will do great things in and through your life. And so things are different. And I hope you, uh, and as we kind of settle into this new routine and what this looks like and, and all this sort of stuff, obviously we normally have a full band, but we've kind of scaled it back. But we at least upgraded with a piano this week. Anybody excited for the piano? Where's Carlos at? Carlos, thanks for tickling those ivories. I think they're plastic, but thanks for doing it. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, we normally have a host segment, all that sort of stuff, but we're just going to kind of jump into things because we don't need a lot to come together because we have God and we have each other. And Jesus says those are the two most important relationships in your life, when you love him and love other people. And uh, so we're going to kind of get down to business. We're going to go after it tonight. And uh, it's just such a joy to have you here. And I just, anything that you've heard or felt about church, let's kind of just, we want to focus tonight on it on a relationship with God, what that looks like, and a relationship with each other, what that looks like. That's our focus here, and kind of doing everything else differently, um, even though this isn't my home church, right? This isn't the church I'm normally in, um, but it kind of smells, I don't know if it's weird or good. Anybody, I don't know what that smell is. It's kind of like you sprayed Febreze in my nose. It ain't mold, bro. Look, for real, I was mucking out of house this morning, TMI, but don't worry about it. Um, and you know, I've been in this for two weeks. I, I'm privileged to work for a church, and we kind of just stopped everything. And they were like, go take care of the people. Go take care of the city. Uh, be present in the lives of the people. And so we were mucking out a house. It was an in-law's quarters in the back of a garage that hadn't been touched yet for two weeks. The door was closed, and the windows were closed. So it was in there just gest gestating. Is that a word? Gesturizing. Anyway, it was in there pasteurizing and... Um, <laughs> Literally, there was mold on the ceiling. That's how bad it had gotten in this room. This house took on seven feet of water. You stepped in there. You still stepped in like a quarter inch of water. And I was doing good. I was manning up. If you've been with me, some of my boys have been with me. I got a weak stomach. But I'm like, Lord, you are my strength. You are my very present help in time of need. And I busted through a wall, kind of brought the crowbar down through, and it wafted into my face. And I just lost all my cookies. I couldn't hold it in. I was in the front yard, in the backyard, just puking my guts out. That's how my day started. How'd your day go? Anybody else having a great day? <laughs> That's why we're not at B-dubs right now. Um, but no, thank you guys for being here. Uh, genuinely, the only announcement we have is it, uh, we have baptism coming up at Praise, um, which is meeting at Calvary coming up on October 1st. And so if you want to walk in newness of life, or sorry, let me say that wrong. Uh, if you want to let the world know that you are walking in newness of life with Christ, you've already made that internal decision. It's an external way. It's showing people of what's happening on the inside. Your faith in Jesus Christ is very personal, but it's never meant to be kept private. You're supposed to go public with your faith, and that's what baptism is. If you have any questions about that, go to our website, praisechurch.tv, and uh, that'll, that'll be great. So that's the only announcement I have for tonight. So let's pray, and I'm going to jump into what I think is going to be a very special and deep, meaningful evening for all of us. And so let's pray. God, God, I thank you that it doesn't matter where we're at, you're there. God, I thank you that whether we're in Church on the Rock North or at Praise Church or at Calvary or in, in our houses or in coffee shops or in restaurants or bowling alleys, you're there. So may we live as if you are really there with us. In fact, God, your, your word says uh, that you actually dwell inside of us if we make Jesus our God. If we follow you as our God, Jesus. And so may we live as if the Holy Spirit is actually living in us, working through us to bring your kingdom come to this earth. So tonight, use me, your servant, uh, to speak. God, use the guest speakers that we have here tonight to glorify your name. And God, for every person that's in the sound of my voice, God, would it be your voice that touches their heart tonight? That would be your voice that turns the, the key, that drops the coin tonight in their life. And so, God, I, I believe that you can and will do great thing here tonight. And if you believe that and if you love Jesus, say amen. 
Amen. I said that weird. I don't know what happened at the end of that. Okay. Um, so I want to read you guys from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tonight. And um, so let's just read this together. Uh, this comes from Paul who wrote a letter, um, uh, you know, inspired by God, given some of God's wisdom, wrote a letter to this church in Corinth. And it's crazy that it's relevant to us today about the truth and wisdom of God. And he says this. He says, for just as the body is one, I'm one body, and I have many members, right, fingers, eyes, ears, nose, and toes, and all this sort of stuff. So we are one body with many members, and the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Jesus. So it is with the family of Jesus Christ. So it is with the body of Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And so there's an analogy happening that we are many different members, we are many different people, but we are one entity. We are one body. The analogy is that some of you are the toes, some of you are the ears, some of you are the, uh, are the, are the arms, some of you are the head, some of you are the bald head like Tosh, some of you um, are different types and different parts. It's an analogy, right? Analogy of saying a different thing that we say around here is because of Jesus we are family. We are brought together as the, the people of Jesus Christ, uh, adopted, co-heirs with Christ. God becomes our father. Many members, one body, many different people, one family. And I love the way that it just ends there. It says, you were all baptized into one body. There are many things that are different about you. It could be your skin color. It could be your economic status. It could be uh, where you're from, the sound of your voice. Uh, it could be any of these different things that, that, that divide us or are different about us. But the way that it ends, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter your economic status. We are all one body. We are all in the family of Jesus. Amen? And so that's kind of like the truth. And we, we've heard that before. But the way that this ends, and, you know, our pastor, Pastor Reg, spoke on Sunday about this and talked about it and then was like, you know, if we really are the family of God, if we truly believe this phrase, because of Jesus, I now can look at you as brothers and sisters, that should change a lot about the way that I treat you. It should change a lot about the way that I approach the relationship. Specifically, at the end of that teaching in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul says this in verse 26. He says, if one of the members, if one entity, if one part of the greater sum suffers, all of us suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. And here's the truth that's in that. We know that if one of our natural family members, maybe you have a brother or a sister or a, a, a mom that you're really close with or a dad that you're really close with or a grandparent that you're super close, close with, one of your immediate natural family members, if they got flooded out in Harvey, we know that we would drop everything and we would go help, wouldn't we? You know that you would. You know that you would drop everything and you would go help. And that is kind of what is inspiring this here tonight, is that if we really are family, what are we doing to bear one another's burdens? What are we doing to, to make sure that we step into someone else's mess the same way that Jesus stepped into our mess? What, what are we doing to ensure that we step into the physical mess so that we can meet a temporary need of a current suffering so that we might meet an eternal need of the relationship with God? Amen? And so that's kind of the idea tonight is to say, how do I get to that place to where I really, deeply, truly understand and see with my spiritual eyes what is happening around us? So here's what's going to happen. We have two guest speakers uh, they are family members. They are people who love Jesus. And because I know that they treat Jesus as their God, I know that they are now my family members. They've been coming to PYA for a while, and one of them has suffered a lot. They've lost everything. And then another one I'm going to honor. He's been with me as we've worked through the mucking out process. And so one conversation is about suffering. One conversation is about honoring. And that's kind of what's going to happen tonight. So can you help me welcome Becca Gonzalez, everybody, as she comes to the stage. Okay, so this is Becca, and we are going to share a few photos really quickly of her home. And so share that, that first photo. I know the projector isn't great, but um, uh, this is her house. And I'm going to show the second photo for us. And that's another picture of her, her, her home in this flood. And so tell us 
Um, Because my house didn't flood, right? And I I was high and dry throughout the whole thing. And it was crazy for me that it was so calm and there was so much devastation everywhere else. And so just tell us the story of what happened. Walk us through all that sort of stuff. Um, So we decided to move to Pinewood about two years ago. Is it on? It's on. Okay. Um, Yeah, so we moved to Pinewood about two years ago. My mom, like, decided she wanted that house and it just, God put it there. And it was on the market, like, out of nowhere. And, like, the day it went on, we, we found it, and we got it for a really good price, and we renovated it, and it's beautiful, and we loved it. And my mom said, like, I'm going to be, like, buried in the backyard. Like, I'm going to live in this house forever. And my dad said, we can move to the hill country. <laughs> we could, like, you know, go somewhere pretty. And she's like, no, this is, like, I'm staying here. Um, and it had never flooded, even in, like, I don't know if you all heard about the 1994 flood um, that hit most of Pinewood and got most of those houses flooded. Um, this one, it was fine. It, like, got, like, four feet from the door. Like, it didn't even get close. Um, so we were like, eh, Harvey, it'll be fine, right? So um, it, we bought a bunch of, like, movies and a new game for the Wii, and, like, we're just going to hunker in while the storm hit. And um, my dad got a bad feeling about it, and so we um, we packed up, like, I had a backpack and a, and a little, like, carry-on thing, and... Um, we had our little bags of our, you know, best or, you know, favorite things or whatever. Put everything else up as high as we could get it. Um, my stuff was, like, three feet off the ground. Cause like, it's, even if it gets in, it's just going to be a couple inches. It won't be a big deal. And we had tile floor. We weren't worried about it. We went to my grandma's house. And um, her house was just, like, eight minutes up down the road. But it was not in Pinewood. And Pinewood floods a lot more often. So we thought we were fine. And we moved. And um, within just, like, a couple days, um, like, we, we knew for sure, like, everything was gone. It went from, like, we're fine. Dad was, like, talking about it getting up to the light switches, and we were like, <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, then that's about where it hit. So um, we barely had anything. We knew that whatever we did leave in the house um, either was going to be flooded or contaminated, and we probably couldn't get back to it, and we didn't know how much more it was going to rise because it kept, like, overnight. It would be, like, it was fine, and then we'd go to sleep, and we'd wake up, and the water had risen, you know, feet. Um, and so that was scary. My mom stopped sleeping. Like, everybody just didn't go to sleep. They just went back and forth to windows trying to figure out what was going to happen. And um, then we heard about the dam and that getting released, and we were right by a canal at my grandma's house. So we moved to my other grandparents' house with a two-story, and we're like, maybe we'll be safe here. And so we moved all of our stuff a second time. And... Um, we were there for one night, and during that night, they cut off the water. So my mom's like, we can't even stay here. Like, this is crazy. Um, and we knew people that had taken this certain route up to the Austin area and that that was safe. And so we left about two hours behind my boyfriend, and he told us, like, how the water was going to be. Uh, we had six people and our couple bags in a five-seater Jeep, <laughs> which was illegal, but all we could do. Um, it death wobbled all the way up there. Like, it was a really, really bad car. Um, but we took it up through about a foot of water and evacuated to Austin um, and watched the rest of it go down. And um, so the water stayed in the house for about six or seven days. Um, it got almost five feet up, and um, we had most of everything, you know, maybe a couple feet off the ground. So um, only the things in the very top are salvageable, and even those are dirty. Yeah. We have some pictures of the inside of your home. That's yeah, that's, that's again my the projector's room. not great, but that's everything's just kind of tossed. That's my stuff, and that painting. Like I don't know if y'all saw that painting down there, but y'all know Jesse, right? Like where's Jesse? Where'd she go? Jesse hand painted that for me for my birthday this past year, and it's like white now. Like it, the colors aren't even there. I was gonna try to save it. It's just yeah. <laughs> she <laughs> she says you're making another one. Yeah. I'll take one too. So that's my that's my room. That's my sister's room. Yeah, this last picture was crazy. She has two little twin sisters, Faith and Hope. And, uh, you know, I have two little daughters that are about mm-hmm. the ages of, of her sisters, and that's their room. And, and I, I was one of the people that carried out one of those mattresses. And it, it just, have you, guys, have you guys been in one of these houses that's been flooded? I mean, it, it stinks to high heaven. Yeah, And it was you really just, bad. you lose everything. Yeah, and it's not just that it was wet, like the septic tanks busted too, and that stays in there for six or seven days. So even the things that like, oh, you can wash it, it'll be okay. Like, it's going to grow mold in a month. Like, I'm not going to try to damage my family by keeping something like that. And so uh, we see the pictures. They're horrible. I know we've seen the pictures, like, 
online and on the news. Um, how many, uh, we did this last week, but I know we say if when one of us suffers, all suffers, but genuinely, it's when many of us suffer, we all suffer, because it's more than just Becca. If your home flooded, or your vehicle flooded, or your, your family business flooded, or the business that um, you own or, uh, flooded, can you raise your hand? I just want to see who, come nice and high so I can see it. Um, I know it's weird, you're like, I don't want to raise my hand. So look around. This is the amount of people that are in Becca's shoes. And I could have brought any number of these people on the stage to talk about this. And I, it can get desensitizing a little bit, too. And, and I want to speak against the whole idea of being like, well, it's just your possessions. Like, you know, put your focus on things that are eternal. It's like, those possessions hurt. And you're allowed to be like, I don't even have, like, you know, a backpack full of clothes. And, yeah. and even trying to replace all the finances and all that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. Help us really connect to your suffering. Like, help us really connect to that place where I didn't lose anything, so I don't necessarily know what you mm-hmm. went through. But help us to just genuinely connect to that so what was, like, one of those low moments for you as you it, reality set in for you? Um, when they were first talking about, like, all of our stuff being gone, I was, like, kind of just numb to it. I was, like, that's fine. Whatever. It's stuff. Like, we'll get it later. Um, and so I went to my house um, a couple of Sundays ago, and um, my all my things were, like, like, literally used as, like, to cover the mud on the walkway. And um, I found, like, you know, my, my, my favorite things that were all, like, in one spot or all, like, trash all over the, it was, like, in piles on the side of the road, and um, I had, a, like, a thing put together of all my memories from Montreal. I went to Montreal and studied for the summer, and all of my memories and art that I had done while I was there, that's all soaked, and, um, like, my grand like, I had my grandma's dresses that she had saved forever for me to wear, and, like, I loved them, and I wore them all the time. And those are gone. I had earrings from my great-grandma that had, like, my great-grandfather's uh, wedding ring, like, diamonds were in them. And she gave them to me th- to wear and keep. And those are gone. <laughs> like, it's just random stuff. Like, I can't replace that stuff. And, yeah, like, it's just stuff. And I have the memory of it. And I have other things. Um, but, yeah, it's not fun. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know that when, it, when I was able to get over to your house and... Um, when I was there, your dad was there, mm-hmm. and uh, it was him and a few people. It was actually Warren and Garrett, PYA fam, that were over there helping, mm-hmm. and then I rolled in with a group of five guys and just to help with the big stuff, and uh, honestly, one of the craziest moments for me in this entire process, your dad was trying to be so strong, and he just, like, collapsed on me, mm-hmm. and it just, like, I got to pray with him and kind of build up his spirit for a little bit, too, and it's just, like, to me, that's that picture of just like, even some Christians are like, I can't be weak right now because I'm supposed to be strong through this. You know what I mean? It's like, God can be your strength through the storm. Doesn't mean you have to stuff it down and not feel it. Like, let, they're allowed to feel it. And you're allowed to just hug them and be with them and, and that sort of stuff. And I didn't necessarily say anything to your dad. I just hugged him for a minute. Yeah, and yeah. I just held him for a minute. And it was just like, I got you. Like, we're here. Like, and we'll be with you for months you know, and stuff like that. So talk about some of the ramifications. Like, your life is flipped upside down as far as your family now Mm -hmm. that three weeks ago, you had no clue. Like, it was just regular, all this sort of stuff. Talk about the ramifications of it all now. Um, Yeah, so my, um, I'll, like, I'll tell more about this later, but my family's in Austin now. They're most likely going to move to Leander, which is kind of by Round Rock in that area. Um, My, both my parents' sides of the family are up near Austin, so um, it works out and God's, like, providing really cool stuff there, but um, they're mostly going to move away, and I'm going to be here. Um, I have a dorm on campus, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm fine, and I have, fam- like, friends to stay with, and um, I'm, I'm good in that aspect, but I'm away from them for now. Um, I was supposed to start um, a program on campus for university students um, called a Creativity Gym, and I was really excited about it, and it was definitely something that God was leading me to, and um, I would started, like, stockpiling supplies for that, and, like, um, like I had all these books collected. That was my research, and I'd done so much research while I was in Montreal that I had written down and got all this stuff together for it, and that's now gone. So, uh, and then we lost, you know, several weeks into the semester, so that actually isn't even happening right now. It might happen next semester, and that's what I'm hoping for and praying for, so y'all pray that with me, that that gets to happen, because I think it's definitely something that God was telling me to do. Um, but what I had prepped for and the timing that I had planned is is no longer possible. So 
um, my entire semester looks different. And um, for a while, I, did, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to come back to Lamar at all. So I, I thought I was going to have to like move schools and do just something different or stop getting a degree or, you know, um, whatever. Luckily, my jobs are still here. So that's fine. My dad doesn't have his job anymore because he's moving. Um, my sister might transfer, but she's not sure. So it's, it's yeah, tight. it's the more that I talk to people who this has happened to, then the, they're suffering through this and they've lost everything. It's not just physical. It's it's family, it's the loss, and it's the feeling of being alone, and the, and not, and it's just, and it's a whirlwind, and it's happening so quick. It happened in two weeks. It's happened in two weeks, and yeah. it's gonna get even more real in two more weeks. Yeah. And so we can't be like, oh, the storm happened, and everyone's boast, basi basically, everyone's <laughs> basically mucked out, we're good. We've got to be present for the family, amen? We've got to be present with them through these next few seasons, but you're a strong young woman, right? And I've been able to, um, uh, kind of journey with you mm -hmm. through this a little bit. And so I'm excited about this part of the mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, and you were like, heck yes, I can't wait to be interviewed because I want to talk about Jesus, yeah. right? And so talk about how, talk about that whole aspect of like how you've seen God in the storm, how you've seen Jesus in this storm and how that's, how that's kind of helped y'all get through what you've been through. Yeah, um, two things to preface. One, last week while we were doing, like we're in worship, like God was like, yeah, you're going to need to talk to them, but not right now. I was like, I'm, what, what? Like, you want to, like, get on, like, just interrupt the worship set? Like, what am I doing? And I was like, I'll do it, but I don't know what I'm going to say. And he was like, no, not yet. Just, like, be prepared. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then you asked me, you like, this week. You didn't tell me that. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, no. no, I just realized that, like, today I was like, oh, that definitely was on my mind last week. How weird. And then um, I forgot what the other preface was. So Oh, oh, so um, – weird random thing about me. If y'all have been in my small group or have known me for any long amount of time, you probably know this, but um, so seems random, but I had a guy that I dated for about five years and I thought I was going to marry him and um, that got taken away from me when I was 18. And so like all my future was like gone at that point. I didn't have any friends and I didn't have anything. So all I had was God. And then right around that same time, my brother left and he's a prodigal. He's living a life that um, is definitely going to like gonna hurt him besides just not morally where he needs to be and he acknowledges that there's a God but he doesn't feel like that's important to him right now like he'll come back to that later whenever he wants um so that was a big stress and it should have torn my family apart and led to a divorce and my parents and led to us having doubt issues but we are stronger in Jesus than we ever were and um so the combination of those two things like they literally happened within a couple months and after that like I was like okay, well, I'm good. Like, <laughs> I don't ever have to worry about anything again because if I've still got God with me now and I'm still, like, stronger in him now. Like, I didn't have faith until that moment, which sounds backwards. But um, that January is when my relationship with God actually started because I didn't have anything fake to go off of. And so I was like, my life's been taken away from me. I'm good. Like, I don't have to worry about it. So um, with this coming, like, I have a weird sense of peace about it that, like, my my future has been taken away from me already. My perfect idea of a family has been taken away from me already. So my physical possessions can be taken away, and it'll hurt. But he's still going to be God. Now, not to, not to say that he, it, this doesn't suck. Like this is awful, <laughs> and I hate it. Um, and I wish it were any other way. But also, I've gotten to see him so much stronger, and God is bigger to me now than he ever was. So that's a preface. Um, but yeah, so this that was story, just the preface. Guys. That the story. <laughs> the story is. Um, uh, so my mom, about a couple, a couple before my brother left, um, for a couple of years, my mom ran uh, like a network of volunteers. So like a bunch of families that uh, were Christians and wanted to serve the community, but they weren't sure like where to go specifically. She coordinated them into people that needed help. So resource and then people that needed it. And she connected the two. She loved it. It was her ministry. She's an administrator. She's the head part of the body. Like she's the brain. And it was where she was supposed to be, and it was awesome. And then, to, like, my brother happened, and um, she lost all sense of worth that she was worthy to even do something like that, and so she stopped. And it was, it was allowed at the time, like, it was okay, but um, she was definitely not being used to her full capacity. But she saw all these connections. So when all this hit and people start, like, the needs started rising, because never have I seen a community, a, a, yeah, so in need, um, also, people were coming in with resources, and people that hadn't been flooded said, like, okay, well, we can take our stuff down to half and give you half. Like, what do you need? 
And so they didn't know where to go to, so they went to my mom because they knew. And so um, she was like, maybe God's trying to pull this back together. Like, yes, this is the time for the church to come together, but maybe this is another time to create more family and um, minister to more people by using the connections we already have. So um, she started talking to people, and um, one lady that she worked really closely with when the ministry was alive, um, she had a friend that was too far away to really do anything hands-on, and so she wasn't allowed to, like, no, not allowed. She wasn't, like, able to, to be there for that part of the ministry. But for this, she was great because she could, you know, you know she get things organized from outside. And um, so my mom got in contact with her, and um, the lady, like, straight up asked her, what do you need? Be audacious. Ask for big things. What will change your situation right now? So she prayed about it, and at 1 in the morning, she was like, we need a truck because we have the death wobble five-seater Jeep that's illegal for us to actually drive in, and I'm not leaving my kids half in some place and taking half with me, that's not going to happen. Like, I can't separate them like that. So she asked, and she was like, she texted six people, and within, like, five hours, um, they had a meeting with a guy in the biggest um, car lot in Round Rock. Those just happened to be the best, the best man in the friend's wedding. So, you know, whatever, God's got it. And um, we sold the Jeep for really high, you know, really good price and got this truck, and it was a, it's a great, resource and we can get a lot of stuff in it so we can take a lot of stuff to other people she's like okay well we're about to get a lot of resources into us like we should probably get some storage units so she texted people about that and um that went through the friend chain i forget how many people it went through but i think it was just two or three but they passed the word passed the word passed the word and um within i think it was within the same day as the truck um someone had previously had this house for rent and in the past month they felt like it needs to be dedicated to someone that lost everything in Harvey but specifically a family that is ministry minded and could do a lot more with the house than someone who's just going to live there could and so they were going to offer it up um, free of rent they were going to fully furnish it with the members of their church who are really really excited to help and um, they wanted someone who was going to be able to minister through that resource. So, like, this is going to take a big load off of them. Let's give it to them. So um, that went back through the chain and got to my mom. And she was like, oh, that's awesome. I'll definitely start looking into a family that could get that together. And that's going to be great. And the lady's like, no, no, like, it's you. Like, this is for you. God's, like, got this ready for you so you can start your ministry. And she, like, I was, I was it was like midnight. And she, like, physically, like, collapse like she couldn't do it she's like okay I need a minute <laughs> like this is crazy because like she had been running this ministry this whole time this lady just got a house for her in like a day like really um so that house was in Leander which is where my boyfriend's family is from and so like we already have people over there that know it's a good place and um it's in a really good place did you I, I don't know if you've got yeah, the pictures yeah pictures. yeah so um they were driving to the house to go see it. And this is the, the name of the, like, road mark. And then the other one is Providence. Not Providence. Yeah. Providence. Yeah. Uh, Providence Drive is, like, the other, like, Dowlin that they have to turn on. Um, and so, like, it was sign by sign, like, literally, <laughs> that uh, God is, like, providing this for them. And so um, not only do they have a house, but it's getting fully furnished. And whatever's in there, they get to keep and um, use in the next place they move to. And so... Um, they'll either start paying rent once my dad gets a job or move to a smaller house and, you know, whatever. But God's providing that way. Um, God's provided people from our friends and from our church um, to come and help us muck out our house. And we didn't have to spend the 20000 on that to get that done. Um, the lady who originally lived in the house, that's her childhood home, lived in the back of Pinewood. And hers has been completely gone, like 12 feet covered. And... Um, said I know this is a bad situation this is a bad timing but can I buy your house like I'll buy it bare bones just get it to code or whatever you need to do to it and we'll buy it and so we already have an offer on the house which we're still debating my, my dad doesn't have a job yet so if you want to be praying pray about that but um but I have no doubt because like seriously what he's done so far it's all in his timing you know um we were in a FEMA hotel when the thing happened, when the house got offered to us, like we didn't know that it was gonna happen, but we had already made this hotel room and we were in Round Rock. We had chosen to go to that area instead of going to Houston or going to you know another place. Um, Leander, by the way, is like 20 minutes from my mom's family and my dad's family. It's like straight in the middle, of course. Um, 
like, because God's cool like that, and he just does great stuff. Um, and, like, just everything is provided, like, immediately as soon as my friends saw that, um, I don't know if it was something I posted or something, like, it word got out that my, my life had been affected, and I can't even count the amount of people that texted me and said, what do you need? I'm getting my clothes together right now. Like, like um, so many people. Can like, I interrupt for a second? Yeah. In that entire, however many minutes that was, um, I guess I'm not the only one who goes through a preach clock. But, Sorry. Uh, and however many minutes you just said, think about all of the ways that she, I asked her a question, how did you see God in this? Yeah. Every single time she talked about how it came through someone else. So it wasn't like God came down and was just like zapped her and was like, here it goes. It's other people were being obedient to what God was calling them to do. Yeah. And in her life, she saw God in their obedience. Yeah. And that's what we've been called to do as a family. Yeah. And that's just, and I've had to learn that as I grow older. It's like, God, I just want you to be like a genie, just do some cool stuff. And mm-hmm. he's sitting there saying, I'm asking you to do some cool stuff in other people's lives. And they will not see you. They will see God through you. And that's what we've been called to do. And so that's, that's incredible. Anything else you want to add before? Because we had another yeah, interview. Really, but really give me, short. Go one more really thing. Short. Um, just to that, like, I actually asked one of my friends. I was talking to her, and she was like, well, I'm going through my closet right now. I was like, it's really okay. Like, don't worry about it. Like, God will provide. It'll be okay. And she was like, God's providing through me to you. And the crazy thing about that is she's not even, like, a super, like, religious person. Like, she's, uh, like, she just was one of my friends that knows that, that that's important to me, and she's like, I don't know what this is, but I feel like I need to give you my stuff, and I'm probably, I'm pretty sure it's because, like, God's orchestrating it through me. Yeah, Yeah. that's awesome, incredible. Can we love on Becca for being able to share her story? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so if one of our members suffers, we all suffer, and I hope that you are now more connected to what that looks like and, and all that sort of stuff, and Many of us are suffering, so many of us should be suffering as well, right? But then if one member is honored, we all rejoice. And now this one may come off as a little bit more difficult, but uh, so it's been 14 days since I got back. I evacuated to Georgia with my family, got back the Tuesday, the day that most people are getting back into their houses. So I'm on like, I'm on day 14 of mucking it out, but that's my job. Like, I'm just blessed. I get to do that. I get paid every day to go and muck out houses. So I'm not that good of a Christian. And... uh, so it's just, it's the reality, right? Uh, but I'm, I think I counted up, it was like almost, I think 10, I might be wrong, but nine or 10 of those 14 days, uh, Peyton has been with me mucking out houses. And he's not getting paid to do it. He's just doing it out of the abundance of his heart. And we've been at the church mucking out the church. We've been in homes mucking out homes. And uh, I think we need to honor this guy as a picture of what everyone's doing. But uh, can we just honor Peyton? This is Peyton LaFleur. Come up, buddy. Okay, so we got some good stories, right? So we've been together uh, a lot these last couple of days, a yeah. couple of weeks. Uh, show a couple of pictures that I snapped. Um, we ripped out the sheetrock of this one wall, and there's this, like, sweet wallpaper mural. And uh, I want those to come back in style, honestly. It's, it's beautiful, honestly. It really is. <laughs> it's good stuff. And so Peyton's back in the back corner there. And then I just snapped another random picture. I didn't even know that you were being doing this. I just was, like, taking pictures for social media and stuff like that. And uh, so that's why they're bad, because I took them. But um, so that was just Peyton, a couple of pictures of him helping us out. But, uh, man, we've had some, we've had some adventures. Uh, at one point, you were ripping down a ceiling, and it started raining ants on top of you. Yes, it, that's true. No lie, no lie. That's just true. <laughs> uh, Sam's brother, Alex, this man's crazy. He's wild. In a good way. He's tough, strong. And he was just pulling out the, uh, the roof, I guess, and all this water falls on him. And I'm like, are you okay? Like, are you okay? And he's just like, I'm fine, man. I'm fine. And we keep going along the wall. We pull another uh, roof out. And then all these ants fall on him. And I'm like, you're definitely not okay now. And he's like, no, I'm fine. And I'm like, I guess I'm fine too. So we just mucked out ants for about 20 minutes. I didn't get bit, though. They were everywhere. We're talking thousands of them that falling from the ceiling. Part, yeah. There were a couple of girls there acting like girls, dancing around, getting scared. Yeah. And, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I didn't look at the person. But anyway, uh, k- why? K- k- give, me a, give me a why. Like, why spend 10 of the last 14 days? And that's that I know of. You probably went and helped other people when you weren't with me. Um, what was some of the motivation behind going out, bud? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Becca for going first because this is the weirdest thing I've ever done. And anybody that's known me for a while knows that I'm, I guess you'd call an introvert. I don't really talk to people, and now I'm talking to like 300 people. And the it's, like a, it's like 120. 120. But. It looks like a thousand, <laughs> but uh, he make a good preacher, man. There was 300 saved last night. Anyway, the only how that the only how that I'm able to do this and go out and work is by is by Jesus Christ. He changes hearts and he fixes homes. And truly, the only how I'm able to not just break down in anxiety right now is by God, the grace of God. So that's how I'd like to start. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the main reasons is because my house is fine. It's, it's, per it's good. Nothing happened in my house. And, I mean, who would I be to just sit there in, in comfort and not help those who aren't, you know, that's who, have, who don't have what I have? Yeah. That's awesome, man. And I love that mentality that I've seen from followers of Jesus and from people who don't follow Jesus. And I think that it's, I was talking to Tosh about it, but I think people are just getting a taste of the joy of selfless living, the joy of living beyond yourself, living for something greater than yourself. And that's what, that's what perfection looks like in the future, is living selflessly, loving selflessly, and that only way to get there is with God. And it's been such a beautiful picture to meet so many people. We went out on Saturday, and I was out there with a, with a woman who uh, was of a Muslim religion with a head wrap who came down from Iowa and served with Praise Church. And it's just like, I want her to, to see the, you know, there's joy in this, but you can have this forever in Jesus, right? And, and it's just so cool to see everybody stepping up, and it's awesome. <laughs> Give me one of your favorite moments. Do you have any favorite? They don't have to be funny, but I don't know why I laughed, but because uh, we've had some good ones. Probably the ants. That's one of my favorite moments. Um, Sam's brother again. I tell you, he's wild. Instead of using a crowbar, he just punches she rock out of the wall. <laughs> True story. This is true. That's probably one of my favorite moments. Uh, um, on the third day of helping out at Praise Church, um, I forgot his name. He has a red beard, kind of like you used to have, but not, you don't have it anymore. But I forgot his name. He came and got me, and he was like, can you come help out at this house just down the road? And I was like, sure, I'll come help. So we get in there, and it's just it's two people, a, an old couple, and... Um, they needed help moving the um, heavy things out of their house, the, you know, couches and stuff like that. And so we get started, and we get started on helping and moving the couches out. And the older man, the husband, he was, um, I guess, ashamed that he couldn't move the stuff out of his house himself. And you know how, well, you guys might, might not know, but, like, you want to always be a man. You don't want to always be strong. And he was ashamed that he couldn't move the heavy things. And he, he I just told him, I was just like, uh, right now I'm strong, but your whole life you've been strong. You've provided your wife with this whole house. You've done, I don't know what you've had to do to get what you have, but you have it now. So let me take your burden for you. Yeah. And I guess he start, He kind of started to, you know, not cry out loud, but, you know, tear up. And that was probably one of my favorite moments. Yeah, that's cool. Cool. To be someone's strength in their time of weakness is cool. Mm -hmm. How has this changed you? Um, has this, I mean, two-week process of just, pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, seeing all of this sort of stuff. Is there anything that has changed about you or anything that you've experienced through this, um, just personally? Like you said earlier, when you, uh, I don't know how, I guess I'll rephrase it, when you go closer to God, you know more about God. And just waking up every day knowing that I'm not helping to look cool or, you know, to look good, but I'm helping to help somebody else. And that's what God's all about, to save. So going closer to that has made me realize that God is uh, providing God, and he doesn't provide just by, you know, miracles or floods or things like that. He provides through me and you and everybody else, and that's just, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, and we get to be a part of it. It's like God yeah. wants to bring his kingdom through us, mm -hmm. and, and it's such a joy. And uh, can we give it up for Peyton, everybody, my man? Do it. Anything else you want to say? No. You're good? I'm ready to go. Okay. <laughs> Love you, dude. Thank you so much. Y'all can stand. We're going to go into a couple songs of worship, and uh, I want to have a couple closing remarks and one final scripture to share with you um, uh, tonight. But there is, as I was thinking about this night, connecting with those who suffer and connecting with those who have um, gone out and actually stepped into other people's mess, 
my goal is as we, you know, as we celebrated with Peyton um, that he stepped into somebody else's mess, that that, that that would be something that as we celebrate it, it would be replicated. That we'd be challenged to move in that direction. Um, and as Becca was willing to share, that that would break our heart and be like, that's my family. And it would motivate us to step into someone else's mess. And that was the goal. And as I was, as I was, I was like, all right, that's it. But then God laid this final scripture on my heart for this service. And it was out of one of Jesus' teachings. Go ahead and throw that on the screen for me. Where Jesus taught his brother. This is James, the brother of Jesus. It's just one of these ideas of, you know, in Matthew chapter 6, this is probably where James is getting this from, where Jesus has a sermon on the mount. He says, the wise man builds his house on a rock. He's the one who is a hearer and doer of the word. But James says a little bit more succinctly, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only and deceiving yourself. I had to check myself a few days into this flood because nothing happened in my home. And I said, God, if, if, if my heart isn't broken for my city, do I even love my city? God, if my heart isn't broken for, for Becca, do I even love Becca? Or am I deceiving myself? Or am I being deceived that I love getting together at church? And I'm not saying you shouldn't be here. I, what I'm saying is, is it can't be just this. I love going to church as much as the other person. But if all you do is go to church and you're not the hands and feet of Jesus to this world, you deceive yourself. And you're not being obedient to God. You can't be hearers of the word only. You've got to be doers. It's got to sink so deep into your heart that there is a burden to be compassionate, not just passionate. Because compassion moves from you feel it and you move into action. That's what compassion is. And you may hear me say this a billion times over the next six months. Step into someone else's mess the same way that Jesus has stepped into your own mess. And I want us to be hearers of the word and doers of the word. And you may be sitting there saying, well, I can't be the, the one mucking out. I'm going to be with you in the front lawn, puking out your cookies, like uh, that's kind of thing. As I've learned through this, we're two weeks into this, there's so much that each of us can do. You know what's the best thing that any of you can do? One of the best moments that I've had in the last two weeks, it was when I was giving the ministry of presence. It's where you just show up. You just, you're there. You're just you hold and you hug and you listen and you, you, you shut up. You show up and you shut up. You know what I mean? You're just there. It's called the ministry of presence. If one of your friends or family, if, uh, if one of us has lost something, we can't only be there when the storm happened. We've got to be there through the next couple months and just show up in their life. While you're sitting in your comfy recliner, <laughs> I don't know if anybody sits in a recliner. If you're sitting in your comfy at home, someone else is sitting in a hotel room wishing they had a home. So text them, hey, come hang out with me. I'm going to come. Hey, if you want anything, then I'll be there. No, go be with them. Bust down their door. It's called the ministry of presence. So if you need to do, if you're like, what can I do? Number one, if you want to be doers and not just hearers, it's the ministry of presence. Go and do it. Second, it's the ministry of prayer. Right? Uh, the way that I heard this yesterday from a training that I was in, it's like most people are like, oh, we're going to pray as the last resort. Well, it must have come to this. I'm praying now. No, prayer is the first resort. It's the first thing you should do for someone. It's the first thing we should do is to say, God, build them up. Comfort them by your Holy Spirit. And you should be praying for the, in small groups tonight, you're going to learn who in your small group has lost everything. You need to write that down in your journal, write that down in your phone, and you need to commit that family to prayer every single day for the next five months. It's called the ministry of prayer, the ministry of presence, the ministry of prayer. There's plenty of opportunities for us. And it's the ministry of the church. Now more than ever, people are willing to come to church. Now more than ever, people are searching for hope in their devastation, searching for hope that goes beyond their, their circumstances, understanding that they are powerless to certain forces in this world, to hurricanes. They're powerless to certain things, and they're looking to find security in something else when they can't find security in their home. They can't find security in these other things that will wash away. You can find security in Jesus Christ, amen? And so it's the ministry of presence, it's the ministry of prayer, and it's the ministry of inviting them to be a part of this. And then that's, that's, just, that's being a doer of the word. Get out there, muck out some homes. Get out there, go to praisechurch.tv, sign up. You can, that's a perfect way to get a text every day. Make sure everyone in the small group is being taken care of. 
And so tonight, as we begin to worship, I just feel led. If you lost your home, I don't want this to be a last resort. I want to do the first thing that we do. If you lost your home or you lost your car, can you come forward and kind of just stand up here at the front? And we're not going to do anything weird. <laughs> All we're going to do is pray for you, which may be weird, but it's a cool kind of weird, I guess. So if you lost something, if you lost your home, you're relocated, you're looking at studs when you go to your house, come on up. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. Don't let someone be up here alone. Someone else get up here and put your hand around them. Put your arms around them. Come on, someone else get up here who didn't lose something. Put your arm around them. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray because that's what we do. That's what a family does. And if you can't reach them, just kind of come up and you kind of stand in the in kind of the back here. But let's pray. God, I thank you for, for this promise of family. I thank you that I don't have to just live life with surface level relationships, but I can live life with deep, meaningful relationships. I can live life with a deep, meaningful relationship with you, and you want to be a father to me, and you want to take care of me in the storm. You want to give me perspective in the storm. And God, I thank you for that, and I thank you that I can look around this room to my family members who are hurting, God, and feel a compassion for them, God, that, that they are hurting, and I am hurting for them. I am hurting with them. God, give us a, a heart. God, give us that family feel here. God, give us that compassionate heart, God, that we would become a family, that we would be a family, not just in words, but in actions, not just hearing it, but doing it, God. And so I pray for their family. I pray for the peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray for the comfort that comes from the living God. I pray that you would begin to work in their lives like you've worked in Becca's life, in her family. God, that you begin to open doors. God, that you would show up in their life through us, that your kingdom come through us as we, as we, as we are obedient to what you're asking us to sacrifice, as we're obedient as you ask us to do things that are out of our way, that are stepping into their mess, God, that you would show up in their life through us. Here we are, God. Use us as this family. You've placed each of us in this room for a reason. Whether it's their first time here tonight, God, and you're opening their eyes to deep, meaningful relationship, or if they've been here a hundred times, God, that this would be one of those moments that we look back on and say, this is our new normal. We take care of family. Family takes care of family. And God, God, you take care of us because you are our family, and we're going to take care of each other because we are family. And so, God, I pray that you would do all of this in your name, we pray. If you love Jesus, say amen. 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 We're going to sing a couple worship songs. Um, feel free to hang out here or get to a place that's comfortable, but we're going to respond with some worship, um, a few songs here. So um, I love you guys. Let's sing three songs, and then we're going to go to, we're going to, go to small groups. Let's, can you lead us? Let's go.